Hey, John here. Let's talk about Boolean algebra. What is it? Where did it come from? This guy named George Boole came up with it. Uh, I don't know, a hundred and some years ago, uh, 1854, yeah, 150 years ago, give or take. Um, he publishes this book called Laws of Thought. He kind of fig he sat around thinking about all these these concepts. What does it mean? How does logic work? And what are the rules? And he uh, uh, codified the uh, these basic um, operations and created a, a, an algebra uh, of of logic. Okay, so this web page here in Wikipedia, you can flip through here and you can read about the guy's life and what he cared about and where he lived and what he did. Okay, the bottom line is for our purposes, we only need to focus on the actual Boolean algebra and these basic operations. Okay, so let's look and see what's going on here. What are the facts? What are the truths that this thing describes? Boolean operations use Boolean values. All the variables in a Boolean expression have the value of either false or true. And yes, this is computer science, and right away we're dealing with binary values, right? You can have one of two possible values. So Boolean values are either false or true. We can express them using zeros and ones. Normally people use the zero to represent false and a one to represent a true. If you look, read this footnote right here, this number one, down here I point out that you might want to think of this a little bit different, okay? In Boolean algebra, and you have a one-bit binary variable, this is absolutely the case right here. All right, but in reality, when we write C programs, quite often we're not just dealing with Boolean one bit values in a conditional expression. And we'll see when we start writing and looking at how C programs are interpreted and compiled on the machine, uh, we need to deal with what it means when you have an integer variable, like with a number 23 in it, and you treat it as if it is a Boolean value in a conditional expression. Well, it turns out in that case, another more general way to think about this is to say, look, zero is false, okay? Anything that is zero should be considered false, and anything that is not uh, false is therefore true. So in my example, when I said, oh, what happens if you take the value 23 and you treat it like a Boolean uh, variable? Well, it will be true because it's not zero, all right? So just a side note, this will come back later on uh, as we move forward. Okay, so how does this whole thing work? First of all, all variables have either one of two values, false and true. And it has three basic operations. One of them is called not Okay, it's a function whose output is defined to be whatever the input is not. It's the opposite of its input. You could express it like this in equation number one over here and say that the output Q equals A bar. The bar over the A represents the not function being applied to the variable A. We can draw up what that means in a truth table that describes every possible combination of its input and the associated outputs over here uh when uh you know out of nowhere when the when these variables have no uh, meaning quite often you'll see the value q or d or something like that be used for the outputs in this handout I use the letter Q to represent the output so how do you read this thing for each row in this table you say here's the input and here's the output you get out of the not function. Down here is if you draw a schematic of an actual machine that has a not function in it, the input is this pin we say on the left or a wire that comes into what we call a gate, this symbol. And this little bubble over here represents the not function taking place. And this pin over here, the wire coming out of it, represents the output. Okay? Now, the main reason I wrote up this handout was to maintain consistency among above all else, because if you Google around, even in Wikipedia, two or three different pages linked to from that George Boole web page, they mix and match many different notations, so you need to be prepared. 
Sometimes the not function is this bent thingy that looks almost like a minus sign, but it's not. You see this little angle downward. It's this bent uh, backwards L thing that uh, precedes the A. It's not even on uh, US keyboards anymore. So it tends to not get used that much, but you will see it from time to time if you Google around or read a bunch of Wikipedia pages. The A with a bar over it is very common. You also see the A with an apostrophe after it is also another common way to represent the not function being applied to the variable A. Okay, you need to understand the notation being used if you're gonna read a text. Again, this handout, I'm trying to maintain highest level of consistency and point out the pitfalls if you wander around the internet, what common uh, variations will you see? When you write a program in a C language or any of the C languages derived from C, which is the huge number of very popular language, you know, your Python, Java, JavaScript, all kinds of things, they all use the same operators. The tilde in front of a variable represents what we call a bitwise not operation. We'll talk more about that later if you don't know what it is when we get to talking about programs down the road. Logical operators are like conditional expressions. Bang is sometimes the word I will use. I've heard this referred to as a ball bat in some uh, uh, circles as well. So the exclamation point in front of a variable is the logical not as opposed to the bitwise not. Again, we'll talk about your bitwise stuff when we want to apply them in programs down the road. Okay, so that's the not function. The and function. Uh, the AND function uh, is defined where the output is to be true if and only if all of its inputs are true, okay? Now, this has two or more inputs, okay? Normally, it's got two. In this context, we're going to just deal with two input AND gates and functions, I should say. And uh, equation two shows you generally the notation you'll use. Uh, this thingy here, sometimes called a wedge, uh, is the operator for the AND uh, function. This thing has two inputs, therefore the truth table has to account for all combinations of all the inputs. So for every value that A could have, we show all the possible values that B could have. So when A is a 0, B can either be a 0 or a 1. When A is a 1, B can either be a 0 or a 1, okay? You'll notice uh, I'm consistent when I draw my truth tables. Basically, I would argue you're just wrong if you don't number them in this order. These are counting in binary from 0 up to 1, 1, where the, least, the smallest number is on top here, and they count up as you go. So this is in binary. These two digits is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. As you move on, you're going to want to always follow the convention otherwise it'll just confuse everyone and they will misjudge what you've done in here and it'll create no end of problems count in order in binary from zero up to the maximum value exactly as i've done right here okay so here's what we show a truth table for the and function uh the output here is true if and only if all the inputs are true and it's only this one case on the bottom every other case the output q is false okay because you don't have both of them uh, inputs are true. Here's the schematic symbol for drawing hardware diagrams. The input's on the left, the output's on the right. Looks like the letter D sort of, okay? Again, you've got different notations you see on uh, different uh, textbooks and on websites and things like that. The notation I will want to use is always this, and the reason is because if we use this notation or this one, you could confuse it with a multiplication operation that we all learned in grade school. The raised dot and the just exposed uh, variables next to each other like this can confuse people, all right? So I will try to be consistent as possible and always use this wedge uh, notation. Absolutely unambiguous if you use this one, okay? Again, I point these other ones out because you wander around the internet and you'll see all these different notations, okay? If you're gonna write a C program, you'll use the single ampersand to do a bitwise and, and a double ampersand to do a logical and. 
to do the or function. You see where we're going with this. You have an operator that looks like this. It looks like the letter V, and it is, is, is the upside down version of what you saw up here for the and, right? In order to remember which is which, I always just keep in mind the fact that that thingy here, this wedge that points up, looks like the letter A. A stands for the word and, and therefore the other one, this guy down here, is the or. So here's the truth table for the OR. Again, we enumerate all the possible inputs, counting in order from 0 to 3 in, you know, in binary. And you have the, uh, what do we got here? The OR. Yeah, if A is true or B is true or both of these guys are true, the output's true. And if and only if both of the inputs are false, then the output is true. False. Okay, here's the schematic symbol. It's just like the AND gate, but it's squished. This guy's bent in, and there's a little pointed thingy on the right here. This is the output on the right. The inputs over here are these pins on the left. And again, depending on where you go, you'll either see the this V-shaped uh, operator for the OR, or you'll see people using the plus. Again, just like the multiply, this can be very confusing. Always understand the context when you're searching through anything that has to do with Boolean algebra or logic, and you're mixing that with regular algebra and you know multiplying and adding and subtracting. In C programs, it's fine. It's unambiguous because the OR operation is this vertical bar, which we call the pipe. Uh, a single pipe is the bitwise uh, operator, and a double pipe is the logical operator. Okay, those are the three basic Boolean functions. You can, can then composite them together and create new functions. Uh, very common ones are the not and or the nand function. It is defined as a combination of the and, and you can even see that in the schematic. You can see the and symbol in here, and then you can see a bubble over to the right on its output that's stolen from the not gate. Okay, so this is a combination of and followed by the not. And that's exactly what's going on here. Mathematically, it's expressed like this. You have the A and B and a bar on top. We've again mixed the and with the not. The truth table in this column over here is the exact opposite of the and truth table. Remember the and function, the output was true if and only if all the inputs were true. In this case, the output is false if and only if all the inputs are true. So it's the exact opposite of and. It's not the and function, okay? How do you see this one around the net? Well, you basically have the bar over whatever notation that the person wants to use. We beat this dead horse already. In a C program, there is no NAND operator. So you take the bitwise or the logical operator, and uh, you put the AND function, uh, either the bitwise or logical, in parentheses like this, if you want to express the NAND operator. The NOR, like the NAND, is just the OR operation shown there with a bar on top. And again, just like the NAND, you just take the OR function and you invert or not the Q value. Again, common theme, here's the OR gate with a bubble over to the right. This is a NOR function, inputs on the left, outputs on the right. You'll see it expressed like I did. Sometimes you'll see a plus in there. I already, again, uh, this is the, uh, the same convention you saw above. In C, you put the not followed by the or operation in parentheses, uh, whether you're using bitwise or logical like this, okay? The exclusive or. Now, we got to be careful. A lot of people learn this the wrong way, or I should more accurately say they are taught this the wrong way. You want to think of it like this. Exclusive or is a function whose output is true, when there is an odd number of inputs that are true, okay? This is referred to as odd parity. There's an odd number of input bits that are true. That's when the output is true. And the reason you need to understand this is because what happens when you have a three input XOR function? A lot of people are taught this over here. This is the one and only special case. If and only if there are only two inputs. Another way to think of the XOR function is that the output will be true when the two input values are different and it is false when they're the same. Look at this truth table right here. When A and B are the same, the output's false. When A and B are different, 
in this row and this row, the output's true. When A and B are the same down here, again, the output is false. Okay? This is only useful. This special case is only useful when you have two inputs. When you have three inputs, you really need to think about it like this. Count the number of inputs that are true. And if the number of inputs is odd, which is also, it is the universal case. It's also correct in here, right? I have one input that's true and, and the output it's odd. So I, the output's true. And here I have one input that's true and, the, and that's an odd number. Therefore, the output is, is true. I have an even number of inputs that are true here. Therefore, the output is false. I have an even number of inputs that are true here as well. Zero is an even number. Therefore, uh, the output is false, okay? Now, in a schematic drawing, the XOR function is drawn, it's, a, it's, it's an OR gate, and you see this extra line on the left here. So you got this extra guy over there. Input's on the left, output on the right, okay? How do you draw this? Well, you use this circle with a plus in the middle of it, all right? In a C program, they only have a bitwise exclusive OR. There's not a logical exclusive OR, and it is the caret. This is this little thingy that is, uh, if you hold down Shift and hit the 6 on a U US style keyboard, that is the caret. Okay, you have a variable, a caret, and then another variable that's the bitwise exclusive or function. Okay, material implication. This one doesn't get used. There's, there is not an operator for this in C. Um, this is here for the sake of completeness. If you want to express this in a program, you use a you know you 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 express it either like this in C or you know translate the equivalent of this into C, or you can use the ternary operator, which I show you down here. So let's look and see what this is going, what what this is all about. And the material implication of the function, sometimes it's called imp, okay, like this for a single syllable abbreviation. This is a function with two inputs whose output is true. If either A is false or A is true when B is true. All right, you draw it out with this arrow like this. You say A implies B. In simplest terms, it's A bar ORed with B. If you take this English and think about it for a few minutes, it means this right here. Okay? And we draw up a truth table, and you say, "What? well, how does that thing work? Well, if A bar is true, when A is zero, when A is false, the value of this expression right here, with the bar on top of it, is true, or B. So if you look down here at this truth table, when A is zero, the result must be true, because anything or with true is always true, right? Because uh, the or function says if either of these inputs is true, then the output is, is true. You don't even have to look at this guy over there. If I know this expression right here is true, I know the result is true. So when A is zero over here, I know Q has to be true. Done. Or when B is true, the output must be true, okay? Well, it's true here, it's false here, and it doesn't matter because this the fact that A bar, A bar is true in these two cases, Q must be one no matter what the value of B is. Well, when A is true, as it is down here, the output Q must be the value that is represented by the by by the B input, okay? And that's these cases down here, right? So that's the imp function is expressed like this. Oops, with the arrow. If you want to express this at a C program for whatever reason, you say when A is true, the value is equal to B. Otherwise, the value is true. This is a kind of a rearrangement of the words in this definition up here. And that's one way to do it. You could also just simply say something like uh, if uh, tilde A or bang A uh, double pipe B. All right. That would be another way to do it. All right. Regardless, just keep in mind that, you know, there's many ways to solve these problems, right? Okay, so given those basic functions, we can now move on to this table down here. Let me walk through 
this 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 logical thinking here this is kind of a, a this is the big leap given those basic functions we can now specify we can define every possible function that could ever exist with two i should say boolean inputs okay consider the following how many ways can we arrange two bits well we've already looked at several truth tables and we know that the answer is given by two squared which is four okay this pattern we will see a lot in computing as we go. How many ways are there are can we arrange four bits? Well, that would be two to the fourth power, which is 16. All right. With this in mind, we can then start looking at a bigger truth table down here. Okay. Given that these truths, therefore, we can observe that there are exactly four possible ways to arrange two one bit values and we just saw that in every one of these the guys up here there's two one bit values and there's four ways to arrange them okay uh we can also observe that there are 16 possible ways to arrange four one bit values and what we're getting at here in this table is that given these two boolean inputs and the fact that we have four rows in any truth table that have these two single bit inputs, there must therefore be four possible cases for the outputs. And in four possible cases, we have 16 different ways of representing these four digits. So in this table here, I say here's A, here's B, here's the four different cases, for those inputs and then down here in our favorite numbering system called hexadecimal i count 16 different columns of output functions in this truth table all right some of these are obvious some of them are not so obvious one of them that's sort of a trick is what's this function here no matter what a and b are no matter what the values of A and B, if the output is always false, what is this function? Well, we call that the zero function, okay? This one, this was an easy one to forget. When I say, what are the 16? So quite often you'll be able to, to identify all these, but you might forget. Oh, yeah, and then there's the uh, always be zero function, right? Now, along with the always be zero, it should be obvious that there is also an always be one. So over here, I have the function that says here, no matter what the inputs are, the output is always a one or true. So we call that function one or true. Now, if you look at this table and tilt your head up sort of sideways, um, what I'm doing here is counting in binary. This down here being the least significant bit. This one up here being the most significant bit. And we'll review counting in binary as we move along. But for now, uh, a, a quick wave of the hand. Keep in mind, this is counting in binary, okay? Zero, 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 zero. In binary is zero. Zero, 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 one is a one in binary. Zero, zero, one, zero in binary is a two in hacks, okay? So we can go through all these functions. We just looked at several of these, right? What happens when you have this arrangement of outputs? Well, that's the AND operator, right? This is true if and only if both of the inputs are true. Here's the not material implication, all right? Now, it's easier first to look around over here and find the material implication where A implies B, which we saw above. When A is false, the result is true, and when A is 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 true, the output is B. And as you recall over here, you got this 0, 0 uh, over 1, 1 for the A. Therefore, when A is false, the output must be true. And then when A is true, in this case down here, the output must equal whatever B is, which is 0 and 1 down here. So that's this case here. Now, the reason I wanted to do this one first is because it matches the truth table above that we just saw, right? And A implies B, not A implies B. We can look at these two columns over here. Well, if A implies B is a 1, then not A implies B must be a 0, okay? And this case down here is a 1, therefore that's a 0. This case down here is a 0, therefore this is a 1, and so on. So this guy over here is inverted, we say. It's not 
knotted or inverted to create this column over here. That's what this case is, all right? Again, this, all 16 of these are going to be variations of combinations of these three, uh, of the, of, not, I should say, of the functions that we just reviewed above, all right? So what's this guy down here? 0, 0, and 1, 1. Another tricky one because it's too obvious. This is just simply A. Ignore the value of B and just tell me uh, the output equals A. That's what's going on in this column. This is the opposite. This is not A implies B with a bar on here. This is B implies A with a bar over here. And just like before, it might be easier to look at the true one first and then invert it. If you look at this column, you got one, zero, one, one there, and we'll go over that in a second. This one over here would be the opposite. And you get the zero, one, zero, zero. Okay? So this column here is intimately related to the one over here. Now, Again, if you look at all the combinations, we say B implies A, and the, and the rule, remember, is if B is 0 in this scenario, the output's true. So when B is 0 here, the output is true. When B is 0 here, the output is true. When B is a 1, the output is A. Well, up here, A is a 0, therefore we see the 0 from the A right there, and the A is a 1 down here, therefore you see the 1 down there, okay? So that takes care of the B implies A and the B implies A not uh, function here. This over here is another one of the obvious tricky ones. This is simply B, 0, 1, 0, 1, matches this, ignoring the value of A. We saw this a minute ago. This is the exclusive OR. This is obviously the OR function. Given that one right next to this guy, the exact opposite of this must be NOR, okay? This is the exclusive NOR, we say. We don't call that the NEX OR. It's the X NOR for some reason that I don't have any clue as to why, all right? So this is the exact opposite of the XOR function, okay? Um, uh, what do we got here? This is not B, right? So uh, 1, 0, 1, 0 is the exact opposite of 0, 1, 0, 1, all right? Another one that's too obvious <laughs> and easy to miss. We already talked about B implies A. Uh, this is A bar. This is not A, O, O. 1, 1 in the left becomes 1, 1, and 0, 0 over here. We already talked about A implies B. This is the NAND operation. We saw the truth table above. We know how that works. The AND operation is already uh, described over here. Triple 0 over a 1. The opposite of that would be triple 1 over a 0. And the uh, function over here is simply true. Okay, we already talked about that one as well. So this is every possible function that you can ever express using two one-bit binary numbers. That's the point of this table here, okay? This is fundamental. As long as you can do all of these operations, you can build a computer that can actually do anything. This is the most low level as you can go in Boolean algebra. And then this, the point of this course is to build up from here and create a complete computer that is uh, capable, or at least just describe a complete computer that is capable of uh, doing things that you recognize today as running programs, all right? Now, there's some other observations that go along with all this. Some guy named De Morgan came up with some laws, and he said, look, uh, I'm, I, I've noticed the following is true, that A NANDed with B is the exact same thing as not A ORed with not B in equation number 10 right here, okay? Equation number 11 is the uh, kind of like the opposite. Uh, if you take NOR, it turns out that's the same thing as not A and it with not B. The interesting thing here in this De Morgan's uh, laws, this comes up and helps you simplify your expressions. If you were to write a compiler or you were going to build an actual computer with, with, with gates and stuff, and we'll talk about how that comes together later as the course proceeds, you need to understand how to simplify these expressions in order to get rid of excessive complexity. Just like you factor things out, when you write a bunch of code, you want to factor things out of it to get you know replicated things out of the way, remove unnecessary complexity. This is a very important law. We can, and the beauty, by the way, of 
Boolean algebra is is that we can easily enumerate every possible combination. In order to prove something, we can just simply exhaustively state every possible case, then step back and look at it and say, <laughs> is everything taken care of? Do these two columns match? If the answer is yes, you have proven that this is true and correct. So here's a simple proof that De Morgan's laws are are true and inaccurate if we enumerate all the possible values for a and b like we've been doing all along over here i can also show all right for simplicity i don't want to invert these in my head and do the math in my head i'm not that good so what i do is i say look in this equation over here we need to be able to express the nand and we need to be able to express this mess of whatever this thing is over here all right so this is the or of a bar and b bar so i'm going to just create a column and fill in all the all of whatever a bar is. So I'm going to invert a, and, and, and I'm going to just copy that down. And then I'm going to have another column over here, and I'm going to fill in there, and I'm going to put b bar in there, okay, just like we saw above, right? I know I need to be able to express the NAND operation. Now, that one you might be able to do in your head, but if you can't, do the AND, and then create the next column from this so that you're not trying to do too much in your head i make mistakes all the time when i do this just do it longhand you can't screw it up when it's this obvious okay otherwise you could be in some you make a dumb mistake and then it just propagates through all your math and you, you blah, it turns into a mess you can't even see what you're doing all right now if you want to know what a bar or b bar is you now can look at the a bar column and you can look at the b bar column and then you can do the or operation in your head I would argue quite easily because the or function, as you recall, is true if uh, any of the inputs or both of the inputs are true, then the or uh, output is uh, uh, true. So this is a bar or with b bar. So the case that it's false only occurs down here on this last row. Okay, so this expression here, a bar or with b bar, which is this guy right here, is given by this column here. And the NAND function is given right here. You can clearly see that each one of these is the same value. Proof by exhaustive demonstration of every combination of what could be. Therefore, this is always true. This relationship holds. What about this guy down here? Well, we got our A bar and we have the AND uh a b bar so again we look at the a bar and b bar columns over here and the and function is true if and only if both of the inputs are true so a bar true b bar is true this is the only case where this guy will be one here because in all other cases at least one of i a bar or b bar is a false so these guys down here all end up being zeros well what does the nor operation look like well here's the or operation of A or with B. We look over here at the A and B columns and we say, are either of these true? No, it's not. Therefore, the output must be false. And is either one of these true? And the an answer is yes, because this is true, this true, the, these three rows down here in the OR operation, all of these guys are true. So this is the OR operation. We can then easily translate the OR to the NOR by simply saying, if I got a zero here, it becomes a one. If I got a one here, it becomes a zero, and so on as we go like this. All right, and then we can observe the fact that this column here, A Nord with B, which is this set of outputs in this column, is exactly the same as the value in this column. Therefore, this equation here always holds true. Equation 11 is thus proven true by ex exhaustive demonstration of every possible combination. All right. Now, this will come back uh, as we go along. There's a concept of completeness, right? We can observe that given the a function like NAND, okay, it turns out there's a link to a Wikipedia page. You can read all about it. And God knows what notation. <laughs> this will be your first uh, uh, exposure to random notations of whether they use the over bar or the bent thing, uh, angle uh, uh, minus sign thing or uh, you know another notation. 
uh, when they're talking about completeness, okay? The bottom line here is that it says, look, I can show that using only the NAND function, I can create the NOT function. I can define NOT in terms of NAND. I can define AND in terms of NAND, and I can also define OR in terms of NAND. Therefore, what we've talked about so far is given only these three basic functions, all other functions in Boolean algebra can be expressed. The notion of completeness here and the proof by this truth table down here tells us that if I am given a machine that can perform the NAND operation and absolutely nothing more, and I can get a bunch of these machines, I can combine them to create these three functions. And given these three functions, I can create any other possible Boolean function. And I can build, again, a fully functioning computer, which we will eventually see can be built using nothing but these functions here. All right. So just given the ability to express the not and function, it turns out nor is also a complete function. But let's just, one is enough, okay? So we can easily show, again, by by exhaustive, dem exhaustive demonstration, that A bar is the same thing as A NANDed with A. So if you just simply connect, in other words, the two inputs of the NAND function together and just NAND A with A, you will get A bar, right? So how do you do that? So this defines then what A bar is in obvious terms. Well, what does A NANDed with A then define? Well, what do we do? We take A, we AND it with A, which gives us false, and then we NOT that, which creates true. So A NANDed with A right here is going to be true, all right? A, which is false, ended with false, is false, inverted, nodded, gives you a one, all right? A ended with A, one ended with one is one, nodded becomes zero. A, which is one, ended with one, and then inverted becomes zero here. Well, again, I can just look at this column and say this column here exactly equals the values in this column over here. Therefore, this equation right here is true. So what do we do about equation number 13 here, okay? A anded with B is the same thing as A nanded with B, and then nanded with A nanded with B a second time. Okay. How does that work? Well, first thing, let's let's make sure we have a, a, a value for A nanded with B. So that's uh, shown right here, and we've seen it above. This is A and ended with B, one, 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 and a zero here, okay? Now what we wanna do is take this thing here in its entirety, which is this guy right there, and then NAND it with itself over here. So how are we gonna do that? Well, what's one NANDed with one? Well, that's a zero. What's one NANDed with one? Zero, one NANDed with one is a zero. Zero NANDed with zero is the case when the NAND function gives us a one. Now we can again look at this column here and, and observe that is the same thing as A NANDed with a B, which we show in this column here, and you've seen that above already as well. So this thing here clearly is the same as this equation 13 holds. Well, what about this guy down here? A or B, which equals this stuff over here. Well. How does that one work? Well, we got A, uh, well, we got A, uh, we can invert A and so on. You can see the Morgan's happening in here. These two here are basically applying to Morgan's theorem is what's really going on. Uh, so we can invert A and then NAND it with the inverted version of B. So let's look at A NANDed with A, which I do in this column over here. And then we can look at B NANDed with B in this column here, and we don't need to go over that again, right? And then you just simply say, take this and NAND it with that, okay? And that's what is expressed in this column over here. Well, when one 
NANDed with 1 is calculated. That's the one case where you get a 0. 1 NANDed with a 0, you're going to get a 1. One, uh, 0 rather NANDed with a 1, you're going to get a 1 over here. And 0 NANDed with 0, you're going to get a 1. And again, we can observe that this column here has the exact same value as this column right here, which then proves that equation 14 is true. All right. Given all these things, we're moving right along to knowing how to manipulate Boolean algebra the same way we've all learned how to manipulate regular old algebra that we learned in grade school when you're factoring equations and things like that, all right? Because we're going to do the same thing in binary. And again, just like we did with regular old algebra in high school and junior high, you have operator precedence and you have parentheses and so on. The not operator has higher precedence than the and operator. The and operator has higher precedence than the or operator. The or operator has higher precedence than the implication operator. Again, when we're writing programs in our uh, favorite imperative language, we don't even use the implication function so you don't even really have to worry so much about this when you're writing actual code you're really only going to deal with these guys now x or is based on these operators up here therefore it doesn't really have a definition of precedence because the precedence of the x or is a matter of how you implement it okay now if you got a language like C that actually has an XOR operator in it, the language itself has to just arbitrarily tell you what precedence it will use for the XOR operation. And, and C defines it as between the AND and the OR. So if you're writing a C program, you got NOT is higher precedence than the AND, which has higher precedence than the XOR, which has higher precedence than the OR. Okay? That's what this goes on about that here. You don't like that? Use parentheses, just like you learned in grade school, okay? And now, given these precedence rules above, great fodder for quizzes and things like that, we can say that A or B ended with C is the same thing as this over here, because and has higher precedence than or. Just like how multiplication, if this was a multiplication operator, has higher precedence than the addition or subtraction operator, which would be a similar relationship to the precedence that these guys have, all right? This, we can also say that this is not equal to this down here. You have to do the B ended with C before you do the A or with the result of this expression over here, okay? just due to the way operator precedence rules work. Okay, now, given all this other fun stuff, and you can, again, read a lot more about this on uh, Wikipedia pages, um, there are some basic laws. All these, you're going to remember these from grade school. Again, there's associativity, the communitivity, the distributivity, identity, annihilator. This is a weird word. I, want, I always want to say adepotence, but I think the accent is on this O here. So it comes out something like adempotence, which sounds weird to me. I don't know. You grew up in Chicago. Uh, my accent says adepotence, but I think I'm wrong when I say that. You might want to Google around and look for phonetic spellings of this word if you're going to use it a lot in casual conversation. Anyway, so how does all this stuff work? It really works the same way as it did that we learned in grade school. Associativity of the AND operator that says A ANDed with the quantity B ANDed with C is the same thing as A ANDed with B, then ANDed with C. It doesn't matter which order you do the ANDs when, it, when you have three AND inputs, okay? Three input AND function. Same thing is true with the OR. You OR the first two before you do the latter two, it doesn't matter, okay? That's because it's the associative. Commutative property. Can I, is A ANDed with B the same as B ANDed with A? Yes, it is. Is A OR with B the same as B OR with A? Yes, it is. Order doesn't matter. Uh, that's what commutativity means. Distributivity is when you want to factor something out. If I got A ANDed with B or C, is the same thing as saying A ANDed with B or with, then A ANDed with C. Again, you learn how to do this with multiplication and addition. It's the same basic uh, structure, all right? And the same thing holds true for the OR 
over the and. A or B ended with C is the same thing as A or B ended with A or C. Okay, again, it looks a lot like and feels a lot like the stuff we learned in grade school. The identity for and, okay? Anytime you and something with true, we don't even have to care about the stuff. Uh, you don't care that the fact that it was and it was true. Because no matter what it is, this is the same thing as just saying A. It, this this is uh, uh, um, factors out of the equation. Identity for or. If you ever or something with a zero, then whatever the thing is stands on its own. An annihilator. If I and something with false, no matter what this is, the answer must be false. An annihilator for an or. If I ever or something with true, no matter what this is, the result must be true. So these are all uh, intuitive. These in the standard conversational language, when you, you, you create a conditional expressions, you use these things all the time. You may not know what they're called, but <laughs> this, this all here is uh, should be somewhat intuitive if you can speak a language that has conditional expressions in it. So uh, what does the uh, adepidence thingy for and mean? Well, a anded with a is the same thing as just a. A ord with a is the same thing as a. Absorption. These are kind of interesting. They're not, uh, not necessarily intuitive up front, but if you ever say a anded with a or b, you can throw away this whole thing and just say that's going to be the same as A. Again, you can create an entire truth table and show all the possible combinations and prove that that is true. Same thing is true about the or. If I say A or with A and B, that's just going to always be the same as A. Okay? Again, you throw a full truth table, prove to yourself that these things are true. Complementation of and. If I ever say A anded with A bar... It's always false. And if you think about it for a second, of course it is, right? A ord with A bar, well, that's always going to be true. Again, if you think about it a little bit, this is no matter what this is, this is the opposite of it. So if you know that these two thingies are never the same value, one of them must be a one and one of them must be a zero because there's only two possible values. Therefore, this is always going to be a one. That's always going to be a zero. It's the beauty of only having two possible input values, the true and false, the binary numbers. If you take the not of uh, the not of A, these two nots cancel themselves out and you get back to A, double negation, right? De Morgan's, we just saw that above and we saw the proofs that this is true. Uh, by exhaustive truth tables above. So these laws here apply, and you can uh, use them to, you know, simplify equations. You can say, oh, look, you should be able to show any of the following uh, equations are true by applying these above Boolean laws and showing the truth tables and, and so on and prove that it's all the same. Just again, like, yeah, I remember junior high algebra, we said, okay, proof of equation number 39. So I would rather just draw the truth table for this darn thing. <laughs> it only has two input values, so that's going to be pretty easy to do to go through and hunt through all the rules you want to do this by 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 algebraic proof by boolean algebraic proof you can say look if f equals a bar or a anded with b this is your given prove uh, uh what are we doing here we want to prove that um this is the same as what a bar or and it would be this is equation 39 yeah equation number 39 here prove that this is is true that, that that when you simplify the thing on the left which is this guy over here which is again shown down here that you get this as a result okay so how do we simplify this thing well all right given this what do we know well we know that the operator precedence applies right we know if we're going to do this then the reality is you have to do the a ended with b before you or it with the a bar okay so i'm going to just show the operator precedence here in, in number 42 here now uh, once that's all done, we know that we have the distributive law. And basically, to be honest with you, the way I do these personally, I never really... The, my field, my, my expertise and interest in computer science, I never do this kind of work. But what I can do, if need be, I can just start applying any rule. It's obvious that once you look at this, you can recognize the distributive property. And you say, well, is this done? Does it look like I could do something? I don't know. Well, let's just apply the distributive property because we can. It, it, this 
template matches perfectly the definition of the distributive property up here. Just apply it and see if anything interesting happens. If nothing interesting happens, throw it away and try applying something else, right? So in this particular case, we can apply the distributive property. We end up A bar. Well, we're going to get or with A. You're going to get this here. And then you're going to say and, which is this guy right there, A bar or with B over here, okay? You can end up with that. Now you've got some interesting things going on here, right? Well, the commutative property of or means I can reverse these things. Now I do this, this is somewhat unnecessary. I think we can do this in our head and figure out that A bar or with A is the same thing as A or with A bar. And it doesn't necessarily have to look exactly the same way as, um, uh, what am I looking for here? Uh, the, uh, the commutative property. Uh, or the, jeez, this is actually the, um, complementation, yes, the complementation property right up here, right? In order to make, make it match this exact equation, I reverse the order that it uh, appears in here, okay? That's why I applied this step here, okay? I think we could probably do this one in our head is my point, right? Okay, so once you've done the distributive property, you can, you can, you can reverse the order as needed and match the complementation rule exactly as you see above and say anything ordered with the opposite of it must therefore be a one. Now I got one anded with this thing over here. Well, it turns out, I can uh, reverse the order of this as well. And again, that's a little gratuitous just to reverse it so that I can make it look exactly like the identity property where I have something anded with one and I can then just remove the and one, all right, as described up here. Uh, something or other ended with one right here. Something ended with one is just the something, the identity property, equation 23. Okay, and we end up with a bar or with B. So I've just shown by applying all those laws that equation number 39 is true.